Between the kids being home and hosting, everything in our house gets used up in summer. With Instacart, I can save money by stocking up on all my favorite summer brands. I save time by getting everything delivered in as fast as an hour. And I save myself a sink full of dirty dishes by stocking up on paper plates for the annual summer cookout. Save more on summer essentials? Spend more time enjoying summer. Add summer to cart. Download the app to get free delivery on your first three orders. Offer valid for a limited time. Minimum $10 per order. Additional terms apply. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, your go-to source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We hope you tune in often for all things people management, organizational development and change, organizational leadership, and social impact related. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Michael Arterberry about individual, team, and organizational motivation and success. Michael Arterberry, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited. Me too. It'll be such a fun uh, discussion today as we explore uh, issues of individual team and organizational motivation. Um, And I'm really interested in learning more about your background as a motivational speaker and the work that you do um, and kind of how you got to where you're at. So those are all the types of things that we're going to explore together today. Um, I want to briefly share Michael's bio with all the listeners. Uh, Michael Arterberry is, uh, of course, a dynamic motivational speaker. As a teenager, he was fortunate to receive guidance from positive role models who helped him overcome adversity and set high expectations for his future. Grateful for the role these mentors played in his own development, Michael decided to dedicate his professional life to helping people navigate the difficulties of life and launch their future into motion. For more than 25 years, he's been helping teens and adults to use what they have gone through as a catalyst for success rather than an obstacle for failure. Michael received the 2010 USA Network's uh, Characters Unite Award for exceptional commitment to combating prejudice and discrimination while increasing tolerance and acceptance within the community. He's also the recipient of the 2014 100 Men of Color Award for Leadership in Education, Government, Mentorship, Entrepreneurial Success, and Community service. In, 20, in uh, 2008, Michael founded the, young, the Youth Voices Center, a nonprofit with the mission of helping young people to become active, productive members of society by overcoming their obstacles, their history, stereotypes, and even their own self-image and limiting beliefs. I really love everything about that bio and your background. It's tremendous, and I'm really excited to have this discussion with you today. All right, all right. Yeah, you know, every time, you, it's funny with uh, affirmation. You know, even though I know that's me, you're reading about, you know, you sit back, you're like, wow, is that really me? But anyway, <laughs> um, uh, yes, yes. But what I want to do to kind of get your audience ready for who I am, I want to tell a little story, Jonathan. Great. And it's a story about a farmer and a donkey, all right? And this donkey is one of his favorite farm animals. Because once he finishes working with the donkey on the farm, he brings the donkey back home to his house and he allows his kids to come out and they play with him. So he comes down the driveway, the kids come running out the house, they're all excited, they wash him, they ride him, they finish playing with him, and he sends him back out to the farm. And they do this regularly, you know what I'm saying? So one night he brings them home, they come out, they play. They finish playing with him. When he releases him to the farm, everything's good. But while he's wandering during the night, he falls into an empty water well. So when he falls into the empty water well, of course, he can't get out. The next morning, the farmer calls him. He's not coming. So the farmer's looking around the farm, and he finally hears him making noise at the bottom of the empty well. So the farmer walks over to the well. He looks in. He's like, wow, I want to get him out. So he goes and gets six of his friends. They come over to the well. 
They look in and they decide they're going to pull the donkey out with some rope. So they all get some rope, Jonathan, and they start throwing the rope down in the well. They throw it, they miss him, they throw it, they miss him. They finally throw it by his hind legs. He steps into the rope, they shimmy it up his body, and they start to pull. They pull the donkey moves. They pull the donkey moves. They pull the donkey moves. And halfway up the well, they realize that the donkey's too heavy. So they lower him back to the bottom of the well, and now that farmer has to make a grim decision. Now, see, he can't feed his donkey food at the bottom of the well because that doesn't make any sense. He can't starve him because, like I said in the beginning, he was more like a pet. And one of his hot-headed friends was like, hey, just shoot him. He's like, nah, I can't do that. So one of his more reasonable friends whispered in his ear. He said, listen, you don't want your kids to fall into the well. So we're going to have to sacrifice your donkey, but we're going to cover him with dirt, sacrifice your donkey, but your kids will be safe. So all six of them got shovels, Jonathan, and they started shoveling dirt into the well. And every time that dirt would hit the donkey, he would scream. Every time he would scream, it would cause the farmer some distress. You got dirt, scream, dirt, scream, dirt, scream. Then all of a sudden, the scream stopped. When the scream stopped, they gave the monkey... Um, the donkey a moment of silence but then they went back to work more dirt more dirt more dirt the next thing you know you see the donkey's right here more dirt more dirt the next thing you know you see half his body more dirt more dirt the next thing you know that donkey jonathan walks right out of the well that he fell into now check this out every time that dirt came across the wall it would fall on the donkey's back he would shake it off and he would step on it and he took every scoop of dirt that was meant to kill him to save his life. Now, Jonathan, I tell you that story because I am the donkey. And what I want to do is I want to share with you some of my dirt. First and foremost, I grew up in an alcohol. My father was a raging alcoholic. Now, I say raging because you need to understand, like, dude raged from the time I was born until the time he died when I was 16. So imagine when you're going through life as a teenager, young boy, whatever age I was, by the end of the day, something would tap me on my shoulder and remind me, hey, dude, listen, don't get too happy because you got to go home to that father. On top of growing up in a, a home with an alcoholic dad, I grew up in poverty. But the crazy thing is both my parents worked full time, but my father's money went to drinking. My mother was a housekeeper. She cleaned people's home for a living. She raised four kids on a housekeeping salary, bro. So, you know, we didn't have much, but I was a good kid. I never asked her for things that she couldn't afford to buy me. So we kept it, you know, we kept it, you know, in a place where we were okay. On top of all of that dysfunction, now you got to think about the head of the household is an alcoholic. He's pumping that through the whole family. I got older siblings that are being raised by him as well. You know what I'm saying? Then my community, I would love to say, oh, I, my, in, my, in my community, I, nope, in my community, you had people coming from the same place. And so, you know, dysfunction was all around me. But the silver lining to the story, the catalyst and the foundation of why I help people and why I feel I'm a master motivator is because I was able to escape those scars and wounds, Jonathan. And that's what puts me in a position to feel like I have credibility to move somebody to a place of success. Thank you so much for being vulnerable and sharing that background. Um, and, you know, we, we all have difficulties in our life. Um, you know, one set of difficulties might be more extreme than another set of difficulties, but the reality is every individual has hardships, they have struggles, um, they have setbacks, and life is about learning how to leverage those experiences for our growth rather than allowing them to beat us down and keep us down. Uh, and of course, you know, your example is just a, is, is so great because it, it demonstrates that, how we can, even in some of the, the harshest types of circumstances, we can emerge um, stronger because of it, and and then we can pay back. We can we can pay it forward and, and help others 
to learn and grow and develop. And that's, that's what I love about your background and the work that you do. Um, and it translates into organizations, it translates into leadership and how we lead our people and empower our people so that they, so there's a context in which they feel most, that they can be motivated and that they feel like they can grow and, and, and uh, excel and, and succeed. Um, so I'm curious, before we talk more about the organizational side of things, how did you find yourself getting into the motivational speaking um, type of professional role and then starting your nonprofit? You know, um, the, the motivational speaking piece was a natural. You know what I'm saying? It's not even like, I, I don't think I ever woke up one morning and said I was going to do it. You know, I would be at a barbecue and we would hit on a topic. And I would just tell stories, you know, just as vulnerable as I was with the opening story. It's part of my personality that I'm, I'm, I'm I just, you know, that's who I am. You know what I mean? My wife is the, I'm the guy that she, you know, I get kicked on the tables because if you drop a subject, I don't embarrass you, but I'm real, man. You know what I'm saying? And I'm real 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days of the year. So what I, what I do is I just, I've taken that ability to be transparent and I just get called to venues to, to do, you could just throw me a subject matter, give me one line and I'll just be able to take that, wrap it around my life story and, 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 and run. So, you know, and the things I've endured, um, is tremendous. But when I say I, everybody, like you said, have, have overcome something. But I'm a firm believer that we have overcome our struggles, not only for ourselves, but there's other people out there that need to benefit from you and your struggles. Even to the point, if you allow me to take it a little bit deeper, fear is paralyzing, Jonathan. And so I say that to you and you can, your leaders can use this with their employees. There's people in the world that are waiting for you to step beyond your fear to accomplish your goal in life because they need you, bro. They need you to get out of that fear. And then if you don't step out of it, you deprive not only yourself, but you deprive another individual in the world that is waiting for you to step into your success. So, you know, the motivational piece was, was easy. Now I created a nonprofit because I went to school for social work. I had this gift of what I did and I ended up working at agencies to, to, to give programs. They would put it this way. My executive directors would go online, look at a fancy cover, read a few uh, introductions, and then give me a curriculum and say, go, you know, administer this. And it would be awful. And then when it wasn't successful, they would bring it back to me and they would say, listen, uh, why isn't it working? So I said, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fix this. I created my own. I went into my laboratory. I took my experience as a teenager. I took my social work education, and I put together this program called Power of Peace that is powerful. And the reason why it's powerful is because I, I married education with life experience. So this program speaks to you almost like it's a person, John. I love that. Um, I lo I, coming from a family that's predominantly... Um, in the social work field, um, I, I'm from a large family with eight children, and my my mother and father are both um, therapists and social workers. And most of my siblings have gone into social work. I'm 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 kind of the oddball. I'm, I'm black a sheep. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm the prof I'm a professor, and I, I I like to think that what I do is similar in a lot of ways, but I, I just have a slightly different audience. But um, but yeah, I mean it's it's powerful stuff, and it's important. For, uh, for for everyone to recognize how they can uh, how they can overcome the challenges that they face, and you 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 focus on fear. Um, well, 
I shouldn't say you focus on fear. You, you focus on how to overcome fear um, because fear is paralyzing. And so many leaders use fear to try to lead, um, but that's, that's never going to work in the long term. Uh, you can get people to do things. You can get compliance when you use fear-based tactics, but people already carry enough baggage and enough fear uh, and, and um, insecurities about their own life that if you just pile on as a leader to and give people more fear, um, you're not going to get the most out of them. You're not going to get the best out of them. You, but rather, you, you need to help uplift them. You need to help them challenge the narratives in their head about what they're capable of and help them have a bigger vision of what they can achieve. Uh, and when, when you create that kind of an environment, then people can thrive. And, and so that, I mean, that's everything that you're talking about and the work that you do. So I really applaud you for that and for the nonprofit work that you're doing as well, um, because that's just so very important. Um, as we start to shift gears now and, and talk a little bit more about specifically how your approach to motivation can be utilized within an organizational setting. Uh, and when I say organization, I mean, I really, it can be any kind of an organization. It could be a family unit. It can be a workplace that's a nonprofit. It could be a for-profit. It could be a government agency. It could be a community organization, a PTA, what, you know, whatever. Um, I think anytime you get groups of people together organizing to accomplish some kind of a goal, uh, you have someone who's in a leadership type of a role and you need them to create an environment where people can feel motivated. So what are some of the lessons that you take away from your background and the work that you do in your nonprofit and how can that um, be applied within an organizational setting? Well, it's funny that you, you talk about fear and a leader that, that will, will focus on fear to lead. Um, you know, when my program first hit, it was during the era of uh, gangs. Gangs were real, real popular. Um, and, you know, with nonprofits, you have to find what's sexy at the time if you want to get nonprofit funds. So I had to find a platform where people were willing to pay money. And so I had to go into a lot of environments where there were gang-related type of workshop style I was running. Now, I say this to you because of leadership, because a gang, a gang leader will use the vulnerabilities of the youth to recruit. So they're going to recruit a young person that has voids in their lives, and they're going to fill the void and then make that, that, that young person loyal to them because they are giving them what the, they, the young person feel that they're missing. What I did as a leader is I brought him into a workshop and slowly but surely I dispelled everything that they stood for. But I would replace it with something that was good. And what would happen by the end of my workshops, now my workshops are intense, they're two, 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 four days, but two days at a time. So I mean, I'm, I got you for uh, 16 hours, you know what I'm saying? And uh what I do is I'll take a negative, replace it with a positive, um, and I'll get into the specifics. But what I want your leaders to understand is that by the end of the process, just like that gang member was willing to go out on the street and murder someone, when they finished my experience, Jonathan, they would do anything for me to the point where I would make jokes to the school to say, now I have them just like the gang leader. They'll go into a classroom and they'll learn. They'll stay after school to do projects because what I've done is I call it being conscious. So being a conscious leader takes more work. But when you're a conscious leader and you start to connect on a level that is beyond that superficial place. Now, I'm not talking about getting caught up where it's so murky that you have employees that are, that are draining you. But when you get a group of people that really know that you're invested in them, dude, they will start to think that the business is their own. And that's the kind of energy that you want to create. So there's a way of setting up boundaries, but at the same time, letting these people understand and know, like, listen, yo, we, we are in this together. You look good. By you looking good, you're going to make me look good. And then as a leader, you got to make sure that when they do their job, 
that that reciprocity is there, you know, you don't have to reward them because just like a child, if you reward them too much, they start to perform for the gift and not performing because it's part of their responsibility. But you find some balance, man. You know what I'm saying? You find balance and you make sure, you know what I'm saying? With my with my teenagers that I work with, what I do is when I get one that's really, really struggling, I mean, I make them grind, bro. You know what I mean? I mean, grind and grind. And then right when I see a nice little uh, uh, area where I pop in, I pop in and I drop a reward. You know, and it's nice. And I'll give it to them and we'll, 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 we'll you know, enjoy it together. But then immediately we get back into the rhythm of what we have to do. So, you know, my advice to your leaders is the fact that, you know, no, an iron hand doesn't do it. And I'm telling you as a person that's been in that environment, you know what I'm saying? I'm the type of guy, I'm an alpha. So when you come at me like that, you lost. You told, I mean, like from, from the first, first confrontation, if you try to beat me over the head with something and I'm an alpha male, I will purposely try to just go the opposite way simply because, listen, alpha males don't work like that, bro. So you got to know what you're dealing with because not everybody is is cut out the same. Absolutely. Uh, we need to know everyone's unique um, drivers, what, what motivates them the most. Uh, people at different life stages, at different career stages, are probably going to be motivated slightly differently. But you focused in your comment there, about several of those really kind of universal elements that people, that pretty much every person needs. And ultimately, people want to be a part of something bigger. They need to have a driving purpose. Uh, and you talked about the gang situation. One of the reasons why gangs are so successful is because, you take, like you said, you take people who are in really tough situations and you, you fill the gap, right? And gangs create community. They create a sense of family. They create a sense of purpose, uh, and, and they create an engender loyalty. Um, so we, we can, um, have a positive way of creating an environment where people can feel similar types of things. Um, and we can help them feel committed to us and fear-based leadership that, like I said, a minute ago, that can drive compliance. Um, uh, people are worried about losing their job. They're worried about getting punished and being put on a bad assignment or being, you know, whatever the punishment might be. But when you use a commitment driven type of leadership, um, where you build trust with people, where they feel like you, you believe in them and they believe in you, um, where they feel, uh, like they have the chance to truly contribute and have a meaningful purpose in their life because of the work that they do. When that kind of an environment is established, then look out because you're going to have a, an incredibly, um, dynamic group of people and you're going to have a dynamic organization. So that's the type of context that we want to try to create. Um, and it's not rocket science, but it does take intentionality and it does take effort because it's certainly easier to be a fear based type of a leader. Um, it's harder to build relationships, to develop trust over time and to be consistent with people and communicate with them in such a way that they feel empowered. Um, but I hope anyone listening today, you know, can take from your experience, your background and the type of work that you do, take that as an example of what we can do to really change the situation in our teams, in our organizations and help um, drive greater success. Well, yeah, Michael, yeah. Michael, it has been a real pleasure talking with you today. Uh, we're about out of time, but before we part ways, I want to make sure that the listeners know how they can get in touch with you. Uh, would you mind sharing you know, about how they can contact you, how they can learn more about what you're doing in your organization. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Right now is uh, an excited time. I've taken total advantage of COVID. Um, I re-released my book. Um, it's called Be Encouraged. Um, they can get a free copy of the book if they go to shakethedirtexperience.com. They go to shakethedirtexperience.com. You, you put your information in there. Um, and you can you can get a free book. So, you know, that's my book. On top of my book, I've, I've put together a course. You know, I'm about the the the, I, the, the mind is we're, we're part of our thought processes. So for people that are shooting for success, I have a course 
that um, I, I call it the Shake the Dirt experience, but they go to shakethedirt.com. It's a 10-day challenge that they can do a course um, with me, um, again, with my different philosophies. Um, they can reach out to me on my, my uh, public speaking platform, michaelarterberry.com, and then my, my, my um, social media pages, and we'll put them in the, the notes, Insta, uh, Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, um, my name, and so forth. And I'm the type of guy, you know, you could tell I'm laid back that, you know, when you follow me, messages, you know, um, corresponding, you know, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not like, oh, you know, I don't answer people's messages because I'm too important. You know, I like to interact with my followers, you know what I mean? But, you know, they can find me there. Um, I do do corporate um, uh, staff development. So, you know, let your corporate, you know, people know, even though my, my, I, a lot of my work is done with students as of now. Um, I'm looking to get more into the corporate field, but I can come in and whip our office together in a minute to build some camaraderie, get people working together, you know, walking um, in step, you know. So those are just a few things there, John. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Michael. It's been a real pleasure talking with you and learning from you um, this last half hour. I encourage my listeners to to look up Michael, reach out to him, uh, get connected, and leverage some of the, the materials that he has so generously offered and that he can provide. Um, I hope everyone has a wonderful week and please stay healthy and safe and successfully lead in your organizations. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week. Check out our new weekly LinkedIn newsletter, Alchemizing Human Capital, exploring industry trends via original research and interviews with executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We look forward to having you join us.